So our next speaker is Linda Velazquez. Linda is back in the room, okay. And um, Linda Velazquez is a really wonderful person. She's also a landscape architect, and she's the founder of GreenRoofs.com. And so I want to ask everybody, how many people in here, by a show of hands, have visited GreenRoofs.com database? Wow. If you guys haven't checked it out, please check it out. Linda has her finger on the pulse of the global green roof industry. And through her database, she's been able to share all of that with us. Okay, so a lot of the projects we would have never even heard of all across the globe, Linda pulls those together into her database. And it's very easy, easily searchable. So you guys go check that out. It's at greenroofs.com. And she and Aramis Velasquez host the uh, Green Roofs and Walls of the World Virtual Summit. Uh, is it every other year? Is that right? Every other year. And it's going to be in 2017. So you guys check that out too. It's a way to see what the rest of the planet is doing. Our global green roof community, they're bringing that to us and bringing it in everyone's living rooms that without even have to, having to travel like we have to do so often for these conferences with a huge carbon footprint. So check out the database. And um, anything else that I wanted to say there? And I think that's about it. And we'll call Linda up on stage here to begin, if you're ready. And uh, Linda is going to speak about the top 10 eco-agents in a global climate changing world. Did I say that right? <laughs> so all those words somewhere. <laughs> OK, thank you so much, Linda. OK, well, first, good morning. It's such a pleasure to be back here in Portland. Um, I'd love to thank Liz Hart, everyone at GRIT, and Alyssa Starry, everyone at Portland State University, for inviting me back so that I can present my top 10 green infrastructure eco-agents in a climate-changing world. So how do we, as designers, combat climate change, deteriorating landscapes, and our ever-growing population? Well, through green infrastructure, which can be either low-tech or high-tech, and when it's combined with emerging technologies, plus some really powerful thought leadership, well, we, that's how we affect change in this world. So exactly what are eco-agents? People ask me that all the time, and I'm like, you know, like secret agents, except these are people and projects out in the public fighting for the global good of our planet, just, you know, in plain sight. And they're like, oh, okay, now I get it. Well, we live in a blue-green planet, and designing with living architecture and um, all our ecosystems. Give me one second. Um, designing with living architecture in our built and natural environments continues to am ameliorate and connect people to our flana, flora and fauna ecosystems. And progressive governments, really cool avant-garde architects and designers, well, they get it. And so that's what I'll be showcasing today, some important and spectacular projects and people from across the globe who are acting as eco-agents on a meso scale, which is certainly large enough to affect change in your community. Well, July and August were recorded as having the hottest temperatures on record. So certainly we know um, climate change is real. This chart just shows some anomalies and uh, makes it very obvious that we in the design world have to do something. And so without further ado, here's our top 10 list. Transposing 100,000 square meters into a cool stepped landscape park. This is Akros, the Asian crossroads over the sea. It's the Fukuoka Prefectural International Hall in Japan. Here you can see it on Google Maps. It's been around since 1994, designed by Emilio Ambaz. Here you look at the Google Maps, this uh, gray area, and then this massive park of green. Uh, the building itself is the center of international cultural and information exchange. It has this huge uh, daylit filled atrium in the center, a concrete uh, front there, and um, underneath the entire structure lies over 100 million square feet of multi-purpose multi space. 
um, including a symphony hall and uh, tons of other activities. So the designer, Emilio Ambaz, um, designed it so that each terrace contains an array of gardens for meditation, relaxation, and escape from the congestion of the city. This is a humongous project that's stripping with vegetation set in a major park, the only park in Fukuoka, and the architect wanted to transpose the existing 100,000 square meter park onto the building itself with vegetation, and so it did. So there's 15 step terraces, um, which have a series of reflecting pools, and these are connected by upwardly spraying water jets, and of course it creates the sense of a climbing waterfall, uh, which actually uh, acts to mask the ambient noise of the city. Emilio Mbaz looks at the building as a mountain and feels that Fukuoka emerges like a lush green mountain and its green step garden exterior certainly has been a landmark for the city. Well, in 2000, um, Takanaka Corporation, along with a bunch of other people, conducted a UHI study where they wanted to see how the vegetation really was working in terms of reducing temperatures in the city. So they set up measurements on the very top Belvedere level, 10th floor, 6th, and 5th levels. And here you can see the, um, the wonderful images showing the obvious that, you know, what we knew was going to happen, that the concrete surfaces are red and the greenery is, are blue and green, and um, obviously lowering the temperatures. So here you see the chart. It shows a 15 degrees Celsius difference between the surface temperatures of the concrete and the greenery, and they came to the logical conclusion that greening certainly does suppress the um, surrounding air temperature. So Emilio said he wanted to reconcile the developer's desire and need for a profitable use of space with the public's desire and need, in this case, in uh, cities such like, as Fukuoka, for a need for their open spaces certainly achieved this. It's a completely public and open park at all times. And it certainly is a beautiful synthesis of urban and park forms. Okay, number nine. Early U.S. adopters lead by setting the green standard. Well, we've seen, you saw this before, but we certainly do have to start with Chicago C City Hall, which is kind of the one that started it all in terms of municipal green roofs. From 2001, um, it was a demonstration project, which was part of the city's urban heat island initiative. In 2013, the EPA, EPA conducted a study, UHI study as well, and they show, you can see very clearly the differences here in infrared, that uh, the August differences in temperature was that the conventional roof at 169 degrees and the green roof, which fluctuated between 91 and 119 degrees Fahrenheit, which in effect was almost 80 degrees cooler than the concrete roof. So this has over 20,000 plants of more than 150 species, very biodiverse. It's got a variety of shrubs, vines, and two trees. Beautiful urban space in an otherwise um, urban dry canyon. This is the Amy Jocelyn Memorial Eco Roof, which, of course, everyone here knows. Um, the city of Portland has been such a leader in the past. Uh, I know they will be in the future, too. They certainly continue to be so, but we have hopes that they will get back as being a, at least the second leader in the United States, but we hope that they become the first. Um, the Memorial Green Roof is in, is in uh, honor of Amy Jocelyn, who was a beloved local sustainability manager here, and uh, it's the city's first public green roof demonstration garden. It offers powerful educational opportunity with uh, the, the um, fifth floor access being publicly accessible. The actual meadow part of the green roof is not accessible, but there is this nice large courtyard area that is accessible where you can go and look at interpretive signage, look at what plants are, are planted there, and learn all about eco roofs. So this is the uh, green roof before the Hope Garden, uh, where uh, here in the front, the serpentine raised garden bed was simply a representation of the meadow that was already in the major part of the green roof, 
um, planted with wildflowers, grasses, and sedums. And then in about 2009, up through the present, the Hope Garden was created um, where various volunteers come in and plant organic vegetables. Um, they do this to recognize the growing interest and need for local food systems. So in effect, the Hope Garden ho hopes to inspire residents to plant their own ed edible gardens. And there's also a small living wall demonstration here, which is also edible. That's done by one of our speakers, uh, George Irwin of Green Living Technologies. And so the green wall, along with the Hope Garden, all the harvest goes to the Oregon Food Bank. So it's truly a laboratory for um, research, and um, it's been instrumented and studied um, by Portland State University, the city's BES, and others to quantify green roof benefits. And just a couple of them are that the green roof evaporates about 25% of the rainwater that falls on site, and it reduces the air conditioning load between 5 and 10%. Okay, number eight. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about sustainability in terms other than like materials that we choose to use. In our case, we use, you know, plants. But green roofs, green walls, green infrastructure, should also be affordable on a human level. So number eight, eco-affordable eco-agents. Social housing and education equals green healthy communities. This is the Via Verde, the Green Way, in the Bronx, New York. It's a wonderful project that showcases healthy inner city housing. It's got 66 kilowatts of building integrated photovoltaics, on-site cogeneration, community vegetable gardens, rainwater harvesting, and about 40,000 square feet of different green roofs, all planted with drought-tolerant vegetation. Here you can see some of the schematics, some of the different activities that people do on the roof. On the left, you can see the massive array of photovoltaics. On the right, you see the community garden. In total, it has 222 residential units, 71 of which were sold as middle to income households, which were sold within one week of it being open. And the balance of apartments are low and moderate income rentals, which were filled the day that it opened. Here I'd like to highlight an individual, Stephen Ritz. He's from the South Bronx. He's an educator and administrator, um, teaches science in the nation's poorest congressional district at Community School 55. His classroom had the first indoor edible wall in the entire New York City Department of Education, also partnering well, with many people, but initially much with George Irwin of Green Living Technologies. Um, he says, if you can grow food here, then you can grow food anywhere. He was a finalist in the Global Teacher Prize and uh, won $25,000 for his accomplishments. The Green Bronx Machine, he's the founder of this. Um, it's offering education, affordable local food systems, and 21st century workforce development. Uh, he says it's easier to raise healthy children than to fix broken men. And on the, the top and the bottom here, you see some of the, the kids, young uh, adults who have gone through the programs working with green roofs, green walls. And then um, on the upper left, you see his wife, Lizette, showing some of their new work with aeroponics and uh, tower gardens, growing vegetables, and some of the produce that they've uh, harvested from their um, raised beds that they have on site. They do a lot of different systems. Um, some of them are DIY, some of them are proprietary systems. And they build healthy, equitable, and resilient communities. So recently, like in May, they opened the National Health, Wellness, and Learning Center. Steve Ritz, along with the pr principal, converted a uh, empty space in the the school, which is already a 100-year-old um, building in South Bronx. They converted this empty space with his $25,000 that he won. He donated the entire amount to build this for the kids. And it's the first elementary workforce development school and training for residents. He, they have indoor gardens, robotics, and they have a 100% mobile classroom kitchen with broadcast capabilities. They've got solar and pedal power stations and a community, uh, computer lab. 
Um, recently, last week, the Green Bronx Machine partnered with um, Loyalty One and they created the Good Food Machine, which is a pilot program that they uh, um, inaugurated in Toronto to 10 schools at the moment, but they have plans to increase it to 100 and then to 1,000. Uh, and in doing so, just with the 10, they hope to touch 2,300 students. And every kit includes tower gardens, the mobile classroom kitchen, a computer, curriculum, and then they get different educators to come and talk to the kids about the, um, these different programs for healthy eating. And he's really been highly recognized. Um, last Friday he was on the CHEW, and it wasn't just him, it was him and his whole classroom showing exactly the hands-on that the kids do every day. Um, there's a replica of his classroom at the United States Botanic Garden, and today he's at the White House in a, a new festival that they've inaugurated called South by South Lawn. It's all about ideas, people, and new projects. And his innovative STEM curriculum is integrated with plant teaching, um, and their lessons align with the core school curriculum. So some of the um, figures here show that he and his programs have increased daily attendance from 40 to 93% and raised the graduation rate from 17 to 100%. And recently they, they had a 45% increase on the school exams and that's school-wide, not just in these fourth and fifth graders. So his message of hope is, si se puede, which means, yes, you can. But he says, it's Amera, I, American of innovation. Okay, number seven, green and blue. Urban waterscapes using rainwater where it falls. This is the Potsdamer Platz in Berlin from 98. It's a water-sensitive urban design, building integrated water recycling systems, and industrial regeneration on this historic site. Of course, this was where the uh, Berlin Wall stood, and um, Dreisaitl, the designer, says, East meets West. The Potsdamer Platz is a place of healing old divides. The photos, well, the graphic and the photos on the left show it, well, pre-war, during the war, and then on the right, you can see what it looks like today, and then it does um, highlight the fact that this is where the, the wall stood. It was raised completely during World War II, and um, they redeveloped it after the, the reunification in the fall of the wall in 1990. Features an elaborate naturalistic stormwater retention system designed to minimize burden on the city's existing water infrastructure, including a ton of different green roofs at different levels. So it's, the stormwater management and recycling system is fed by 21 inches of annual rainwater, and 172,000 square feet of green roofs begin the process on top by filtering stormwater, which is then released to these, this large on-site buffer pond, which has five underground storage tanks underneath. The cleansed water flows into a piazza for people to enjoy, and the excess is used for gray water, toilet flushing, uh, irrigation, fire systems. Here you see a schematic. Bottom line is it manages 23 thousand cubic meters per year of potable water, which is amazing. The cisterns provide laker for the three-acre artificial lake called Piano Lake, and almost four million gallons of circulated water goes through these filtration beds once every three days. It's won all kind of awards. Give me one sec. but it's a wonderful example of what you can do deep in an urban city on a historic site. Here's Sierra Green. It was completed this uh, year, earlier this year, in Philadelphia, and it has a really highly innovative green-blue system. Um, it's Sierra's Center Park, and it's the city's first elevated park, which aggressively manages stormwater, but also provides this beautiful green space for the residents. 11 stories up, this public park, about 52,000 square feet of green roof, um, offers great views of the city, as well as being just a, a lovely park to go visit. The unique water system lies beneath the sloping lawn, the swaying meadows, and the planters that are filled with trees, perennials, and vines. So Roof Meadow designed these pancake cisterns, they call them, which are really thin detention systems, cisterns. 
They're placed below the paving, and they capture rainfall and then release it gradually to the adjacent planted areas via a system of sutra weirs. The combination design both regulates the flow rate and treats the runoff prior to discharge from the roof. Integrating park programming with stormwater management strategies has avoided the additional cost of at-grade measures to collect and treat paved area runoff. So the developer saved probably hundreds of thousands of dollars by integrating this, these pancake cisterns. They've got 18 trees, over 2,000 cubic yards of growing media. Uh, the green roof area per se is just a little over 31,000 square feet, and the blue covered water system little over 16,000 square feet. Artfully integrating an unobtrusive stormwater management strategy with slopes up to 20%. Number six, turning the ultimate symbol of work, production and pollution into something playful and educational. Well, how do you do that? Well, you start at the Amateur Resource Center in Copenhagen, which is this massive waste to energy plant uh, and the smoke rings, come out um, to visualize the CO2 output, um, and this actually doubles, or will double, as a ski slope. It started in uh, probably a couple years ago, and they're hoping to complete it by the end of next year. So the waste energy plant is also a mountain park, and the 389 million 60 megawatt power station is fueled by the city's garbage. The city of Copenhagen is pretty flat, so when they wanted a new design for this waste energy plant, they decided, well, we may as well make as much use out of it as we can. But one of the really cool features was this educational uh, highlight where a smokestack puff rings come, comes out when one ton of fossil CO2 is released. The ski slope has 15 fronts and forested areas, and the brick facades will be planters. Redefining the relationship between the waste plant and city, it will be economically, environmentally, and socially profitable. Here's some under construction photos from uh, late last year. Number five, a living building embraces biomimicry and challenges lead platinum. Well, that has to be the Van Dusen Botanical Gardens Visitor Center in Vancouver, which is a beautiful structure, um, net zero building designed to meet living building, building challenge. So it's got solar hot water, PV panels, and geothermal borehole. The 20,000 square foot green roof is based on the design of an orchid and featured rammed earth walls. Here you see the, um, the daylit oculus under construction, which proved to be quite challenging, and they came up with, uh, with these retention systems, the georaster, uh, to manage holding back the soil. Uh, so the slope is over 45 degrees, and the daylit oculus also serves as a solar chimney that exhausts the hot air. Here you see a schematic of how it uses 100% of the water, which comes from captured rainfall, and that treats 100% of the black water on site. Here are some of the accolades. It received a Living Building Challenge Medal Certification by the International Living Future Institute. Uh, LEED Platinum certified by the Canada Green Building Council. 2014 was voted the most sustainable building of the year by World Architecture News. And the other cool thing is the, uh, the pedals, the vegetated ramp connects from the roof to the ground, allowing a, a corridor of animals to be able to come through. Um, and in, in this way, it increases biodiversity from the plant and the uh, animal fields. Number four, vertical densification of nature, carbon conscious design. So I'm sure you've all seen uh, these photos of the Bosco Verticale in Milan, which translate to the vertical forest. And it truly is a vertical forest in uh, the heart of Milan here. Uh, there are two high density tower blocks with integrated PV energy systems with wind and geothermal systems. But the cool thing, of course, is that it's planted with two and a half acres of forest. Each balcony has its own tree and other uh, plants. So the urban forest has um, made up of 400 condos and over 800 trees of three, six, or nine meters high with about 15,000 other plants. If this urban forest were planted on the ground, it would cover 
a flat surface of about 7,000 square meters and about 20,000 square meters of forest, forest and undergrowth. So of course, this contributes to our problem of sprawl in our cities. Let's build up. It has 110 and 76 meter high towers, and the peripheral area of single family homes and buildings would also equal the space of about 50,000 square meters if it were on the ground. They think eventually it would be inhabited by over 1,600 specimens of birds, butterflies, and insects, applied for LEED Gold, and is the winner of the International High Rise Award for 2014. The Bosco Verticale. This is a really cool um, project in uh, Sydney, One Central Park, designed by Jean Nouvel, um, vegetated um, green, root, green walls and screens by Patrick Blanc. The green walls are 150 meters high, which for the longest time was the highest green wall in uh, the world, but has since um, it's being challenged by a couple of different ones that are being built. Um, the heliostat has 320 reflectors, which are 100 meters high. And it's the whole development is coming up in phases. This is the first phase. It's five and a half hectares of a mixed-use urban village. Uh, in total, it has 64,000 square meters of green. And this includes 1,200 square meters of green walls, the Sky Garden, which is the green roof on top of the heliostat, and seven kilometers of planters planted with plants that climb on trellises. Here you see some really cool photos looking up. And then the areas at the bottom um, are actually green roofs on structure, on structure because there's the retail and the park itself are built on top. Total 35,000 green wall plants, um, 23 green walls in total, over 250 native species, plus 150 exotics. Uh, the building reduces energy consumption by 25%. The thermal impact of sunlight is reduced by up to 30% because of all the different varieties of greenery. Plus, it looks awesome. Um, the sky garden here on top is um, beautiful, small, petite, uh, offering great views of the city. And it has the, this amazing heliostat below, which reflects sunlight into otherwise somewhat darker areas of the park and courtyards. And here you see it as an aerial, and you can, you can see how it stands out as, a, as an icon of green in the city. Number three, the world's first LEED Platinum Convention Center, healthy, functional, and green. Well, again, back in Vancouver, there has to be the Vancouver Convention Center, which is another stunning building. Um, LEED Platinum for new construction. It's got six acre living roof, and it's the largest in Canada and the largest non-industrial green roof in North America. It's got over 400,000 indigenous plants and grasses. All native plants were selected here. And here are some of their staffs. They've got four beehives uh, for pollination and honey. It has a restored marine habitat. And it has a really cool and sophisticated black water treatment plant that recycles gray and black water for the toilets and rooftop irrigation. It is projected to reduce summer heat gains by up to 95% and winter heat losses by up to 26%. The different roof slopes are very interesting and very angular, and they range from 3 to 56%. Recycles an average of 100, 180,000 kilograms of materials annually, which is nearly half of the total volume of waste generated which is why it's lead platinum. So the designers, when trying to pick the plant material for this unique project, came up with a whole new planting palette of native, native species for the Pacific Northwest. And the other thing that they did was they created a novel potting mix, which was actually free of peat, which was a first for this area. Got many awards, 2016's first, first healthy venue in the Americas by the World Obesity Foundation, um, top 10 green projects from the AIA Committee on the Environment, and Green Rules for Healthy Cities 2010 um, awards of, Award of Excellence. Number two, the influence of designers taking a leadership role in design, Calibo Architectures. I wanted to highlight a firm who has a history of promoting eco-sustainable architecture 
even though he is extremely kind of out there and very innovative, um, everything he does is about uh, combating climate change. His visionary eco-utopian Belgian design architect, completely 100% inspired by biomimicry. You may have seen some of his fantastical projects. This is the lily pad, which is a self-sufficient floating ecopolis for perhaps 50,000 climate refugees in the future. Uh, via solar, wind, and tidal biomass, it produces its own energy. It'll be able to process CO2 and absorb... Um, what is it? Titanium dioxide? Yeah, into its skin. Uh, the coral reef is another project uh, which resulted after the earthquakes uh, in, uh, in Haiti in 2011. He came up with this um, basically plug-in matrix that could accommodate up to 1,000 pa uh, passive homes in this modular feature that you can arrange in any kind of pattern you want. But he created these two waves. Um, and they're just standardized prefabricated modules that he felt you know, could at least harbor our, our, our climate refugees or natural crises. The Thessalia, is, uh, they navigate the rivers in Europe and Western Asia, and they, it's a hydraulic network in this double hull which filters fluvial water and purifies via the planted roof. I'd like to see how the, that planted roof would do really as it, when it goes underneath these rivers, but that's another thing altogether. The dragonfly is a really cool uh, concept that's supposed to be based on the East River in New York, and it's a metabolic farm, 132 stories high, 600 meters high, accommodates 28 agricultural fields, which includes fruit, vegetables, grains, meat, and dairy. 350 um, meters of surface area in total, and it has an organic ecostructure which integrates renewable solar and wind energies. And the dragonfly, based, of course, on the wings of a dragonfly, is a true living organism, organism being self-sufficient in water, energy, and biofertilizing. The Bionic Arch in Taiwan is another proposed project to help deal with their massive smog problems. Um, these living walls will take in the harmful gases and convert into oxygen, and it will have zero carbon emissions, 23 floors, 380 meters tall. It's solar and wind power, and its bioreactors uh, for, are used for water purification, uh, recycling, and el eliminating waste. Each floor has suspended gar sky gardens inside and out. So it's living walls and green roofs. The Gate Residence is an, a project that's actually being built right now. Um, it's a smart, multi-use complex to be LEED Gold certified, and the architect says it's a combination of trees and building and metamorphizing the city into a vertical green dense and hyper-connected system. The roof itself is a big community garden, has a playground areas, tree orchards, infinity swimming pools, and it's linked by these sky foot bridges. And then the curtain walls are punctuated by green walls. Uh, the next one is Paris Smart City 2050, uh, which is a research and development uh, concept based on the Paris Climate Energy Plan, which will reduce hope to reduce 75% of greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And you can see it's, it's a series of fantastical towers, but they, these energy towers are positive energy, eco-conceived to fight global warming. Sustainable, dense, connected, and very green. And uh, I'll leave you with uh, Vincent, his work here with the Hyperions, currently under construction in uh, JP India. Um, it's agroecology and sustainable food systems growing up around these six multi-use wooden and timber-framed towers. It has a double objective of energy decentralization and food deindustrialization, which is very great. The architect says, combining the best of low-tech and high-tech instead of systematically opposing them, I want to prove to decision makers that strategic links can be established between climate change sustainable architecture, and urban development. He claims that converting worldwide agriculture into organic techniques and biosourced construction, hence the wood timbers, could reduce the worldwide CO2 emissions by about 40% by 2030. Okay, number one, governmental leadership greening the world. I could have picked a lot of different areas of the world who have been leading 
the Green Roof char uh, Challenge and Charge. Uh, I settled on these, and hopefully you'll agree. Munich. To go along with the theme of eco-agents, I chose them because um, I'm, I'm calling it an eco-agent is discovered in plain sight. What exactly does that mean? Well, they've had policy um, going on since 1984 relating to green roofs. And uh, by no means are they the, the German city with the most green roofs. Um, at least 48 German cities have provided uh, financial support. But Munich has grants for voluntary installation of green roofs, and uh, they have offer financial support in areas lacking green space equivalent to $30 per euro per square meter. They have a reduction in stormwater fees if you put green roofs. Uh, buildings with greater than 10 centimeters depth and with a slope of less than 15 degrees pay only 30% of drainage charges. Now, their regulations and urban land use plans say that developers, owners, must landscape all suitable flat roofs with a surface area greater than 100 square meters, which is pretty aggressive. Here you see some lovely Munich green roofs, uh, residential, over, you know, industrial, corporate. And this that I took from, from Jorg um, shows a common type of, of uh, green roof where you have a combination of green roofs, solar panels, and this large community green space in the center, which in most cases are located over underground parking. The eco-agent part of this uh, Munich is that um, the city actually didn't know how many green roofs it had, the, the sizes, the square footage, kind of like what Dusty was doing in London, you know, doing his study. So uh, a consortium of uh, public and private people came up with this new remote sensing tool so it discovered four and a half million square meters of Munich green roofs, which is just amazing. Using the, this high satellite uh, or airborne optical imagery, uh, they came up with the surface areas of green uh, along with the existing uh, building footprints and then were able to determine which buildings could be green in the future as well. San Francisco, US's newest policy leader to be. Well, we all know that there's been California greening going on for a long time in, this, in the San Francisco Bay Area. On the, on the left, you see some more natural eco roofs, probably been around since the 60s and 70s. And on the right, you see some newer ones. The bottom one is the Gap headquarters from 97, and the top is um, Facebook's uh, Google campus, which has a humongous living roof for its employees. But building on the April, um, legislation saying that San Francisco is now the first city in the U.S. that um, must install solar on new construction. They are introducing new, new, a new ordinance called the Better Roof Ordinance, proposing that between 15 and 30 percent of roofs on most new construction must incorporate solar, li a living roof area, or a blend. Uh, the green roof option will allow developers to replace solar with green roof at a rate of two square feet of green roofs for every one square feet of solar, which is truly a win-win uh, combination. And the new addition of green roofs to this requirement will make San Francisco the first city in the country to implement this regulation. The, some beautiful examples in San Francisco uh, proper, of course, is the California Academy of Sciences, uh, the world's largest and first double lead platinum museum, has this two and a half acre living roof, 35 feet in the air, it's got 95 native plant species, and the building is edged by solar panels. It's got these seven dramatic mounds that are um, meant to replicate the surrounding rolling hills with these steeply uh, sloped domes. The green roof um, was under study for quite a few years, and they, did, they created a bunch of different mock-ups to, to check on the slopes and the different kind of plants. They finally came up with this um, bio tray made out of choir. Um, so there's 50,000 porous bio trays, which keep the interior temperatures about 10 degrees cooler than a standard roof. It reduces the low frequency noise by 40 decibels, and it decreases the urban heat island effect by making the surrounding uh, temperatures on the roof 40 degrees cooler. And it absorbs 98% of stormwater, preventing up to 3.6 million gallons of runoff per year. 
This is the Twitter headquarters. Seems like all the major so social media giants are now, you know, that's the new thing. Let's all get green roofs. But they, they have one in downtown San Francisco. They refurbished this building that was um, in a very derelict area, and they've made it into a beautiful roof garden for their employees to enjoy. And the mega, mega one here is the Transbay Transit Center, which will have a 5.4 acre green roof when completed. They say that they'll be done by the end of next year. We'll see, they've had some problems lately. Uh, they've always had struggles, but it's a massive project. Four and a half billion visionary transportation and housing project combination. Hopes to transform the city and regional transportation with integrated water management systems. It will treat a combined gray water and storm water uh, to high standards using biological, mechanical, and chemical water treatment systems. And of course, the massive green roof is nothing to laugh about. Over a quarter mile long green roof will have active and quiet areas for people to gather and, and just chill, have an amphitheater and stage, botanic display gardens, as well as open lawn areas. So the subsurface constructed wetland will be on top. They'll also have a specialty garden called the Water Reuse Garden, which is another opportunity to present um, public education and engagement, get people talking about green roofs, offer some of the uh, environmental benefits and bring it out into the open. And they expect the water relating savings to uh, be about $50,000 per year. Uh, the, cent the center program contributes greatly to regional sustainability. Um, they plan to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, the emissions by some of these figures. The real extension alone is projected to eliminate 36,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions annually. And when the full high-speed rail system uh, is completed in 2030, it should reduce the emissions by another 3.4 million tons per year. And it's on track to earn a LEED Gold rating. Here you see on the right under construction. Okay, I'm gonna end with Singapore. What a city is all I can say. A city within a garden. They currently have 72 hectares of sky rise greenery, which is their term for green roofs, five hectares of green walls, and their plan is to have 20, 200 hectares by 2030. Of course, it's kind of easy to um, have a ton of green roofs in a city state government that says, we're gonna have green roofs and we're going to, to have jobs for everybody because we're that type of government. And when they say it, they do it and they mean it. So I'm just gonna show you some examples of Singapore. Singapore, um, 2008, the Solaris, designed by Ken Yang. It's a continuous vertical planning spine through this 15-story research and development building. And um, they have these really cool landscape garden terraces on each floor, with, which flow continuously, which provide 108% of the landscape to site area. Here you see a diagram. The, um, the two towers are connected with a passively ventilated central atrium, which is naturally daylit. Um, there's planted terraces on every level. It has the vertical landscaping, which is a continuous system of 1.5 kilometers. It has an eco-cell and rainwater harvesting system in the bottom. It's just beautiful. Marina Bay Sands Integrated Resort. Wow, this, this one's amazing. Aramis and I went there um, in 2010 and saw this, and it, it, it's the highest building I've ever been on. It, 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 it was kind of scary, but extremely cool. Uh, it's the world's most expensive casino hotel, 650 feet high, 55 floors, and the observation deck, which you see here on the left, cantilevers 65 meters over the edge. That part is public. Has over 12,000 square meters of curving green roof. The entire area is a green roof, which includes gardens, restaurants, bars, jacuzzis. These cool little jacuzzis also in the public area are, are just set into the edge of the, of the green roof, and you can look at the bay, and you can look at both sides. It's just very cool. Uh, winding pathways. Here you see some sections designed by Moshe Safdie Architects with a ton of people. It's, an, it's a feat of engineering is what it is. It's just a marvel. Here you see the views from the observation center, what it looks like looking down. 
And it, of course, it's famous for its 50 meter long infinity edge swimming pool, which is only open to hotel guests. Although when we were on the tour, one of the, the attendees said her husband just pretended like he was a guest, walked in with a white towel, and just jumped right into the pool. So he enjoyed himself, and I, was, I said, well, I hope he took pictures of that. <laughs> but it's, it's spectacular. I mean, the views are amazing. This is the Park Royal on Pickering, uh, a newer project. It's dramatic. It's uh, truly dripping with vegetation. So they have these um, curving outdoor plazas, and the gardens are planted planted valleys, gullies, and waterfalls, drawing inspiration from terraformed landscapes, just like rice paddies. Here's a view looking up into the building. Here's a view looking from a, a room inside. All you see is lush greenery. Of course, you see lush greenery everywhere you go when you visit Singapore. 2015 Urban Habitat Award winner. Universal Studios Singapore. Um, it's Asia's first movie-themed park, and it has um, almost 400,000 square feet of green roofs. You see, you see them every, everywhere on top of a variety of buildings. The Changi Airport Terminal 3 has perhaps, I'm not quite sure, the world's largest in interior landscape feature. Uh, the green wall is a, like a trellis system with climbing vines. Seven, 14 meters high and 300 meters long. You go in to get your baggage, and while you're waiting, you can at least look at this cool green wall. Um, you can see the massive green wall close up on the right, and the Terminal 3 also has this interior butterfly garden where if you have time to kill, you can just go in and enjoy the cooler temperatures and look at the butterflies. The hanging garden in the CBD is a fusion of arc and nature, beautiful uh, different types of plants here, as seen from the outside. And from the inside, at, at every level, you have these beautiful green walls to greet you. The Kutek Pot Hospital, I've been around since 2010. This is a project that was spearheaded by the hospital's CEO. We heard him speak, and he's a dynamic gentleman who wanted gardens at every level so that people could, the patients could enjoy them as well as, as the, the employees. They can get in there with uh, their hands, plot their own areas, 100% edible gardening here at every level. Five levels of corridor plantings, 81 balcony planter boxes, and a total of eight roof gardens. Here you see some of the planters. Um, he wanted a healing environment with self-sustainable gardens. And again, the staff is encouraged to participate. Has landscape footprints at every floor. The School of the Arts, also known as SOTA. Um, it's uh, a university with, with these three elevated teaching blocks that hover very high up in the air. Here you can see it from afar. I think it'd be very cool if I were a student to be able to, to uh, study in a building like this. And the architect says it draws urban environment and landscape right into the building by WOA Architects. Sky Habitat by Safdie, Moshe Safdie Architects. Um, it was recently finished this year. They're high-end high-rise apartments with private gardens. They have uh, three different sky bridges which link the uh, community areas. They have alleys and walkways on several levels of the, of the city. You can see some of the programming here but better to see them in photos. These are the community areas with another infinity swimming pool. Um, you, here you can see the connecting walkways or sky bridges that are uh, vegetated, community areas. And just gorgeous. Of course, if you have the money, because it's, it's private. Uh, this is just a quick example of a green roof called the Far East Organization's Children's Garden located um, on top of a smaller structure at, at Gardens on the Bay. And speaking of Gardens by the Bay, which I'll end with, um, it's located at Bay South Garden, and it's a 53-hectare orchid-shaped garden plan with distinct ecosystems. We had the wonderful opportunity of visiting it in November, and I think it's my, my favorite project on Earth. It's the winner of 16 awards, including the Landscape Institute Awards 2013, for climate change adaptation, 
and the world building of the year for 2012, and for good reason. They have these two massive um, cooled conservatories, one of which is Cloud Forest Conservatory, and this particular green wall structure is called Cloud Mountain. It's a, a total of seven stories, and it's a cool, wet, tropical montane, and it has these really cool walking uh, skyways that you can go around the building. And on the far side is, is the, wor the world's largest indoor wa um, waterfall, which is beautiful. And, and on the left, you can see the um, part of the skyway from another part of the skyway. And the Flower Dome, which is the cool, dry Mediterranean zone um, observatory. And both of them together are carbon positive, and they cover an area of two hectares. So here you see some of the plants that they uh, display. They have the permit dis display in the back, and in the front they use for uh, different changing um, events that they have where they showcase different horticultural events. And my favorite, the super trees, which are green walls um, of 30, 40, and 55 meters high. They're solar, and they're called super trees, which power the two conservatories and more. It's a unique system engineered uh, to uh, be energy centers of hot water from solar. Uh, the heaters and panels provide um, energy to both conservatories, um, as well as they offer rainwater harvesting. Here you see another schematic, how it captures the sun, everything's converted, gathers the, the rainwater. Basically, it's an intelligent environmental infrastructure. This was designed by Grant and Associates, the solar uh, trees. Um, just an amazing project. It's planted with epiphytes, ferns. It's beautiful. Two of the super trees are connected to each other by a 128 meter long aerial walkway. Uh, this is a view from below. And here I took a view from the walkway itself looking out. You can see the, the, the vegetation growing up. And um, although it's been open now for about three years, you can really see how the vegetation has taken on, growing up beautifully along the way. And of course, it offers beautiful views of Singapore. And um, they're filled with um, solar optics. So at night, these canopies um, come alive with the lighting and the projected media from the planted super trees. And at the end of the evening, like about 9 o'clock perhaps in the evening, as it gets dark, the uh, solar show begins, and it's really spectacular. It lasts about 15 minutes with the uh, uh, interplay of um, solar between all the different super trees. And that's it. And a uh, little bit about greennews.com. We're the international green roof and wall industries resource and online information portal. We invite you to connect with us in a bunch of different ways. Uh, please visit us for all your news, upcoming events, special features. Um, and I'd like to say please do join us for the next Green Roofs and Walls of the Virtual Summit in 2017. We inaugurated our online conference in 2011. We offer it every other year. And we should be uh, online again in the early uh, second quarter of next year. So thank you very much. And stay on, on top of the Green Roof and Green World by visiting greenroofs.com. They have been monitoring it. Uh, PWL uh, Landscape Architecture is, is the one who we could uh, contact to find out about that. Um, the plant palette, I believe, I have a profile for that in our projects database, which I should say is the basis of our project of the week. And uh, we've got 1,650 profiles there and counting. But we do have one for there. And when people provide the plant material to me, then I include it as a link. And I believe they do. If not, um, Rana Creek was involved. Uh, but the people who, uh, you, again, you could, you could just search the project's database for the Vancouver 
you know, uh, extension project and, and, and find the contact information there. But yeah, and they, they do share that. Yes. Yes, Akros, Asian uh, Crossroads over the sea. It's all, it's a, it's a public park. It's completely accessible. It's a uh, cultural building, institutional. It's uh, on, the, on the far side that I didn't even show. It presents a very formal glass facade, banks, uh, corporate offices, again, a symphony hall. Uh, it's a big cultural center, but the back, of these 15 step gardens are completely open to the public. So anyone can go and enjoy all the different uh, meditation gardens and just lush greenery. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much.